Howdy folks, I'm Keith Bowen and this is Hard Rock University. Today's lesson is on communition. No, not communism. We don't have any truck with that around here. Communition. Size reduction. Making things like this into stuff like this. Now, in our case, we're dealing with micro scale to small scale operations. I'll bring up some other stuff too just to kind of give it a thorough overview. But there's only certain things that really make a lot of sense at our scale. And I'll explain that as I go along. So the first thing you start with is something called run of mine material. And whoever's doing the mining should be careful to make sure that the largest particle sizes are suitable for whatever the system is that it's going to go into. The blasting crew, for example, needs to make sure that they fracture the rock enough so that it doesn't cause a big bottleneck at the primary crusher. Um, depending upon your system, I mean, you know, a big copper mine, it might be able to take six foot rocks without a problem. So, you do what you got to do. In the case of larger mines, they use something called a gyratory crusher, which is way bigger than anything we're ever going to use. Here's a diagram of a gyratory crusher. Now, a gyratory crusher has a couple of advantages for big operations. One, it can take really big rocks. It can take big volumes of rocks. I mean, 100, 150 tons at a gulp. And it's very efficient both in terms of energy consumption and wear rates. The negatives are it doesn't move. It's a building. It's a machine with a building around it. So zero portability and extreme expense. We're talking tens of millions of dollars. So it makes perfect sense for a big operation where you're moving you know 50 or 100 thousand tons a day but for something small not so much. Besides gyratory crushers, there's only one major option as a primary crusher or what they call rock breaker. And that's a jaw crusher. Now, here's my little jaw crusher on the RC-46. And it works because the movable plate oscillates back and forth. You throw in a rock or, you know, material and it gets crushed as the plate moves towards the fixed plate and as the plate moves back gravity pulls it down and it keeps doing that until it all goes through. It's a very simple system. It's relatively lightweight and portable for the size. They make jaw crushers like 20 by 36 inch openings that fit on a semi-trailer sized piece of equipment and literally you just hook up a truck to it and drive it around and move it to another place. So they have portability. They're less expensive than a gyratory crusher by far and they don't have quite the robustness and they can't take the volume of material at once. So on an industrial scale a uh, jaw crusher will have some kind of a feeder um, because they tend to plug and you need to be able to get to it when it does. The feeder is usually either a belt feeder or an apron feeder. A uh, belt feeder is just a conveyor belt at the bottom of a V-shaped trench. Uh, things like a loader would dump into the trench and the belt goes slowly towards one end of the trench where the jaw crusher awaits and dumps into the jaw crusher. This allows you to carefully adjust the rate of flow and also to spot any big rocks before they go into the jaw crusher when they're easier to deal with. If you've got hard rock, like say crush, you know, blasted granite, that can slice and dice a belt in a big hurry. So you'd usually use what's known as an apron feeder. It's basically the same thing except in the bottom instead of a belt made out of rubber, you have a track. Think of the top of a caterpillar uh, tractor track as the feed surface and it moves in the bottom of that trench and dumps the rocks into the crusher. 
it doesn't get cut nearly as easily. It's a lot more robust. And at this stage too, you want to try and remove the tramp iron. Depending upon the situation, especially like underground, you may have rock bolts and chain link mesh and all kinds of things you use for ground support that have gotten mixed in with the uh, material. Those are going to cause problems later. You want to get rid of them now. Um, in some cases, you know, you'll, you'll be handpicking it out. You certainly would, you know, would do what you could. But you may use magnets too. After the primary crusher, in many cases, they'll have a, a magnet to detect, I mean, to pull stuff off of the, the belt. If it's a big enough target, too, it'll stop the belt to make sure it doesn't get cut. But anyhow, this is where you get rid of the tramp iron. From the primary crusher or the rock breaker, it goes to secondary crushing. And this reduces it from a reasonable size produced by a, a crusher that can eat the run of mine material. It only efficiently will reduce it so much before it really starts reducing your throughput. And so they will generally have a secondary crusher there to reduce it even further before it goes to other operations. Now in the case of a micro scale operation, to save that secondary crushing step, you may actually use a jaw crusher specifically designed for a, a great amount of size reduction. You know, you may be taking eight inch rock and crushing it down to quarter inch. If you do, uh, first of all, it'll take a specially built crusher to do that, but it's also going to cost you a lot in throughput. Again, depending upon your situation, it may make perfect sense. But as a general rule, you know, your primary crushing on a big operation will cut you down to four to eight inches in uh, maximum size, and in a smaller operation it'll knock you down to a couple inches maximum size and then your secondary crushing will take it down into fractional inches. Now, to reduce it from several inches to fractional inches, uh, there's a couple ways to do this. Number one is the uh, cone crusher. This is more of an industrial scale machine. It does a very good job. It has high throughputs, low rates. You can see it's similar to a gyratory crusher. It has a mandrel that kind of oscillates in a, a circular motion inside a liner. Uh, as such, it's again energy efficient and wear efficient. But they're generally not that good when you start getting smaller. Uh, something that works on a much smaller scale quite well is a rolls crusher. My Keen RC46 has two six inch steel rollers. The material falls through there and gets crushed. Another thing that you can do is take this secondary crushing stage and turn it to a grinding stage too. Now the RC46, those rollers are pressed against each other. There's zero space. However, as the material goes through there, it pushes the rolls apart. There's a some real heavy spring action there and it'll crush it down to essentially a coarse sand. You can also take a fairly modest sized product, you know, half inch to an inch and throw it in a small impact mill and get your secondary crushing along with fine grinding. But your wear rates go up. So let's assume now we're talking about grinding. This is where you're taking material and turning it into a sand or a powder. Uh, the rolls crusher is very good at reducing an intermediate sized product to a coarse sand. It doesn't do a real good job of fine grinding. My RC46 single pass through the rolls gives you about 50 percent passing 30 mesh. Now an impact mill, on the other hand, can give you a much finer grind, especially if it's my impact mill. It's set up 
with a, an air classification system. To get out of the mill, it has to be blown up. As such, the coarser particles wind right back in the mill and get reground again. The grinding circuit, or the grinding machine of choice for the small miner is probably the impact mill because of its versatility, its cost, and its um, mobility. They're, they're pretty small for what they do. There's also another kind of mill used in third world countries called a trapiche, or maybe a Chilean mill. It's called a roller mill, you know, is the basic thing. It has a couple steel wheels and a steel trough. And it's an improvement over the old stamp mill, which was just steel hammers dropping on a steel plate. But uh, I have no familiarity with it. It's only used in small-scale operations, and I presume that it's got relatively low throughputs, but very simple, easy to operate. You know, you could just have a, a burrow as your motive source if you needed it. And uh, probably works reasonably well as long as you don't need to do very much. For the bigger mines, on the other hand, they use a um, ball mill, autogenous mills, semi-autogenous mills, basically a big drum that turns and inside that drum is water, rock, and steel balls, steel rods, or in some cases rocks or a mixture of rocks and steel balls. An autogenous mill uses large rocks of the material to basically grind up smaller rocks into powder. Uh, as such, it doesn't wear out a bunch of balls and so it saves money that way. A semi-autogenous mill or a sag mill uses a combination of rocks and balls to grind up the material. <coughs> and a ball mill uses steel balls to do the grinding. A rod mill uses long steel rods. Now, while ball mills like this, you know, rolling mills, are sometimes used especially in third world countries because they're relatively simple to make um, for grinding stuff up. It's not ideal if you're trying to make something on an industrial durability sort of scale. Um, like a 55-gallon you know, drum will wear out real quick. A plastic drum will actually run better because the plastic doesn't grind away quite as easy. Um, but they're very energy efficient and reasonably wear efficient and as such they're very good for a big operation that will be the mill of choice. Now you've, made, you've heard me say <laughs> a number of times wear. Uh, whenever you're taking rock and turning it into sand or dust it, you're going to have some wear. The rollers have about the least wear because it's all pure compression. They're just pushing against the rock. They're not sliding against it. Um, in the jaw crusher uh, at that RC46, I'll have to change the plates in about eight hours if I'm crushing hard quartz because the, the quartz doesn't get, when, when the movable plate comes in, it's not able to grip it that well. It often will slide up a little bit and that just wears the plate something terrible. So the softer the rock the less the wear but also the less scrubbing action. So the wear plates wear pretty quick. The rollers on the other hand do not. I've, I've never replaced them. I think I've probably worn half or more of the surface off. Um, in the case of an impact mill your wear rates are atrocious especially if you're crunching bigger material. If you're crushing one-inch rock with an impact mill, it, I mean, think of how much energy at a point you generate when a high-speed impactor hits a one-inch rock. And that's going to take a ding or a scratch or a gouge right out of that piece of steel. So you're going to have high wear rates. In the case of ball mills, they have liners in them. Uh, the balls themselves wear out and eventually get replaced, but 
they line the mill also. And uh, as a matter of fact, now they use a lot of rubber liners because they last longer than steel. And it's not the balls against the liner that does the majority of the grinding, it's balls against balls. And so replacing a liner is a very expensive and time consuming process. Uh, replacing balls is real easy. So they'd much rather replace the balls than the liner. If you're going to have a, an industrial quality uh, crushing equipment, all the wear parts have to be replaceable. In the case of a jaw crusher, the jaws have liner plates. So you have a, a structural jaw and then just a wear plate in there that's replaceable. And essentially all jaw crushers do have that. I don't think I've seen one without it. Um, the roller mills, a lot of times I have a shell that can go on the outside of the roller and you just replace the shells. In the case of the impact mill, you have two different things. You have the impactor and the housing. Now many of the lower cost impact mills have replaceable impactors but not liners in the housing. And as such, if you use them hour and hour, day after day, month after month, you're going to wear the housing out. It would be worth your while, if possible, to put some kind of a replaceable liner in there. Um, another thing that helps a lot is you will have, your wear will tend to be concentrated in certain areas. Now, there's something called hard facing. Hard facing is a material that is laid down welding on steel and the, and the material when it's bound to the steel during the welding process has a lot of carbides in it which are very very hard and tough. Now you can't really make steel that hard and tough and deal with it once you've made it. It's not very workable, you can't drill holes in it. It's some really really tough stuff and it would also be quite expensive. So it's better to make the base part out of steel and then put hard facing on the critical areas where the majority of the wear occurs, like the tip of the impactor can, ha can be hard faced quite easily. Um, in the case of the jaw plates on my crusher, uh, they cost about 75 bucks and in hard quartz will wear through in about eight hours. I can hard face them the first time for about eh, four bucks for the set and touch up the hard facing for about one dollar a set. Uh, you can see how that saves you money in a big hurry. So look for places where you can put hard facing in those areas where it's really wearing right there. In an impact mill, you'll see them. You'll know where they're at. Tips of the impactors and the areas where the, the, the flow causes those particles to hit the liner. You definitely want to do something there. Now, another thing we need to talk about with crushing and grinding is definition of particle sizes. You've heard me use it in this discussion, but I'll get a little more thorough for people who aren't familiar with it. When you're crushing down to fractional inch sizes, it's just usually called by the, the size. Inch and a quarter to three quarter rock would be rock that'll go through an inch and a quarter screen and be rejected off a three-quarter inch screen. Very simple. Inch and a quarter minus would be your material thrown on an inch and a quarter screen and whatever goes through the screen is three-quarter inch minus. I mean, sorry, inch and a quarter minus. Now that's depends on what you've got. To fully define a material they will you know, do it like if you're using a, an engineered aggregate for road base or for concrete. It's going to mention the various different particle sizes. It's so much percent this, so much percent that, so much percent that. But in many cases, it, it, you'll, all you'll care about is does it go through the screen or not. So it would be screen size minus, goes through the screen, screen size plus, does not like my table has a 30 mesh input screen. So what goes over the table is 30 mesh minus, what is rejected is 30 mesh plus, which may go to regrind depending on the gold content. Um, mesh sizes 
are used once you start getting into small fractions of an inch, like below about an eighth of an inch, uh, which would be eight mesh, by the way. <laughs> Basically, how many holes per inch? And as such, a hundred mesh screen is screened with a hundred holes per inch. And you can look up on the internet, it's easy to find tables that will give you things. Mesh to micron conversion chart, you know, mesh to inch conversion chart, boom, you'll get it. But anyhow, same principle applies. Is it 30 mesh minus or is it 30 to 60 mesh? Goes through a 30 mesh screen, rejected off a 60 mesh screen. Depending upon what you need to crush it for, will depend on what sizes you need. Um, in our case, you're generally looking for mineral liberation, for a gravity or flotation, or mineral exposure if you're going to be leaching. Now, I made a video not too long ago on what these things mean and, and how you deal with them. But once you've defined what you need to do, then you need to do it. And that's what the crushing and grinding circuit is for. So you got primary crushing, which in something our size is going to be a jaw crusher. <laughs> well, there's a new one called a, a cylindrical jaw crusher that may work pretty good. Um, then you're going to need to do secondary crushing or grinding. And with something as small as us, usually you avoid the secondary crushing phase. Um, although if you're going to an impact mill, it makes a lot of sense in terms of saving wear rates and increasing throughputs. A simple rolls crusher has low wear rates and will, will get you a fine material that uh, doesn't wear it out too fast and will go through there a lot easier. It also can be a lot easier to feed. Um, and in your final crushing, if you need a fine grind, you're probably going to be using an impact mill. You're going to have to use some kind of classification, air classification, screening, something like that to scalp out the oversize and either regrind it or throw it away for your separation technique. And another thing, if you've got a fair amount of water in your run of mine material, it may be a pain in the ass to deal with. Uh, you put it in a jaw crusher, it just squishes and sticks together. Now you can either dry it which, depending on the situation, may not be too terribly difficult. You just lay it out there in the sun and have a stockpile that you go through once a week. Or you may use what's known as water flushing. If you just put a whole lot of water on there too, then it will probably work okay. You're going to have a mess, and then you're going to have to separate that water later. That's where the thickener would come in handy. Anyhow. Water flushing can sometimes work. Quite often in impact mills you will apply water. Uh, water will tend to reduce the, the dust too. You can actually lose gold in the dust. So during the primary crushing, and stuff, a certain amount of water may come in handy for dust, dust suppression. Too much is going to make life really, really tough. Uh, if you have just hard quartz, you'd probably get away with a fair amount of water. If you got some clays, if this was near the surface and kind of heavily weathered, yeah, <laughs> life may suck. So, these are some of the basic principles of crushing and grinding, some of the trade-offs, pluses and minuses. And I hope this information is useful and uh, gives you some guidance on what to look for. Happy prospecting and keep it safe out there.